Welcome back to our organ lesson series. I've been asked if I would talk a little bit about the Brahms Opus 122 Choral Preludes, and that's something that I'm really delighted to do because they're such firm favourites. When I was about 12 or 13, I heard Brahms's Assistel Rosensprungen for the first time on the radio, and I rushed out to buy the complete set, and I've been playing them ever since. Oddly enough, I noticed that in Germany they're played less often than they are elsewhere, and I don't quite know why that is. But anyway, before we start talking too much about these pieces, let's just have a listen to Es ist ein Rosensprungen. I think that's such a glorious work because it's so simple, understated, unpretentious, but beautiful. The hymn itself speaks of a rose, which is a reference to the Virgin Mary, in the context of the, a branch of the roots of Jesse, which is a reference to the house of King David from which Joseph was descended. So it's the kind of imagery that a modern day songwriter probably wouldn't reach for, but which was perfectly normal and understandable in the 16th century when the hymn was first written and was still perfectly understandable in Brahms's day. The hymn itself, of course, with its melody by Praetorius, is one of the most lovely and reflective and quiet Christmas hymns that we still use all over the world and is a firm favourite in the kind of Nine Lessons and Carols sort of event. A funny thing about the Choral Prelude, of course, is that when you hear it, it's almost impossible to detect what the choral melody actually is. As a little experiment before I did this session today, I played half of the Choral Prelude to half a dozen musician friends who I knew would be, of course, familiar with the hymn, but didn't know Brahms's choral prelude. And not one of them actually managed to identify what the hymn was. That tells us a lot about the set as a whole. You know, you often hear that Brahms's Opus 122 was in its way a natural successor to Bach's Orgelbüchlein. And I see what people are saying about that. But we have to say that the purpose 
of the collection is entirely different. So Bach's collection was didactic music, which was intended to teach church musicians everything they needed to know and to be able to do in terms of being liturgical organists. So both organ playing with the pedals and composition and improvisation skills in a liturgical context. These choral preludes are not for that purpose. They are art music which responds to the nature of the chorales themselves. Even those choral preludes which do reference the choral melody more closely than this one are nonetheless of that nature. There are actually a couple of ways in which these choral preludes do resemble the Orgli Buschlein. One is that the choral preludes themselves do take the choral melody once through, by and large. Another way in, in which it resembles Orgli Buschlein, as it happens, is that the set is almost certainly incomplete. 11 choral preludes is a very odd number for Brahms. Brahms liked to publish things in sets of seven. And in fact, Brahms did prepare a set of seven choral preludes for publication. But after his death, another four were found and added to them to become the 11 that we have. What was Brahms intending? In all probability, Brahms was intending two sets of seven. So there are some missing or never written. Perhaps the choral prelude on Ultrarischkeit which exists separately, would have been in that second set and maybe another version, in fact, of Assistant Rosensprungen, because there is the starts of a draft of another version. But we can't really know. All we can say is that almost certainly Brahms didn't intend there to be 11 in a set and they wouldn't necessarily have been published in the order in which they were eventually published. So if you're playing the whole set, you don't necessarily have to play them in the same order. But let's get on with some performance issues. In this series so far, we've talked about Bach and we've been right through the Ovi Buchlein, and then we've talked about Mendelssohn. And we argued there that Mendelssohn is located just on the modern side of a kind of performance watershed that we can identify around the beginning of the 19th century. And the features of this watershed were a new approach to legato, which was based on a new type of fingering and was developed in response to the increased popularity of piano music. And also in terms of pedaling, um, that the new pedaling uses far more toes and heels and different techniques to achieve a legato. And articulation, again, the legato trumps most other things, which leads to longer phrases. There were also changes in ornamentation, but ornaments are not something which we need to address in these pieces. But the next question we can ask is, OK, Brahms is 50 years probably after Mendelssohn's sonatas. So all these conventions are firmly entrenched, firmly established. But in the, round about the beginning of the 20th century, there was another kind of watershed in terms of organ performance. And this was partly the result of and partly uh, propelled new tendencies in organ building, such as um, a multiplicity of imitative stops, new technologies such as electric and pneumatic actions, couplers and balanced swell pedals and so on. So when we think of Brahms we think of high romanticism and therefore we automatically tend to reach for the big cathedral organ of the 1920s and 1930s what we think of as high romantic organ playing. 
But is this actually what Brahms would have expected? Well, let's look, just look back. What did Brahms grow up with, first of all? Oddly enough, he played organs by Hildebrandt. Now, Hildebrandt was an apprentice of Zilbermann, took over, in effect, from Zilbermann. So we're talking there Baroque organs, rather similar to the organs that Mendelssohn played and grew up with. So certainly his background was in an entirely different type of instrument. But what happened later in his life? Well, as Brahms was in his very later years, he was involved in a big project to build an organ by Ladegast. I played recently the biggest Ladegast in Sachsen. I played a Mendelssohn programme there, if I remember rightly. And this was a substantial three manual organ. And the tonal construction of the organ was, yes, it was romanticised from the 18th century, but at the same time, it would have been thoroughly recognisable to Johann Sebastian Bach, for example. So there was a full chorus range with both solid and good and round eight foot stops and upper work and mixtures in just the same way as we would expect from a classical organ. Interestingly, the organ had a swell division, which consisted of four stops. There were three quiet eight foot stops, a flute and a get up to a stringy stop, and there was a quiet four foot stop. So that is a world away from the kind of full swell that we associate with the romantic organ. But this was 19th century romanticism in organ building. And we have to make a distinction between that and 20th century romanticism in organ building. Perhaps the most interesting of all is the 1889 Schlimbach organ in Meiningen in Thüringen. Brahms visited this church often and played and liked that organ. Now, another composer who was associated with that same organ was Max Rege, and Rege became Kapellmeister there. And after Rege's death, in I think the 1920s or beginning of the 30s, that organ was rebuilt in line with the principles that Rege would have wanted. And that included the introduction of a swell division. Now, just think about that for a moment. 1889, that is contemporary, more or less, with Brahms's Choral Preludes, a big romantic organ that Brahms liked, which was nothing like the 20th century romantic instrument that we would naturally reach for. So we must be careful with technology, with actions, and with our tonal concepts. You know, I had a wonderful experience once in the mid-1980s, so it's beginning to be a long time ago, I had a long conversation with Michael Schneider about the performance of Brahms's Choral Preludes. Now, Schneider was himself a pupil of Karl Strauber, and Karl Strauber was a teenager when Brahms was writing these choral preludes. And Strauber later became Thomas Cantor, that's Bach's old job in Leipzig. And it's known that while he was in Leipzig, he played all of the Brahms choral preludes, so he knew them well. Strauber, of course, was even better known as an exponent of Reger's music and played very much in that kind of style. And so I learned from Schneider how a, an organist in the beginning of the 20th century would have played these works, and that that was quite a revelation. But at the same time, we have to remember that that is not necessarily quite how Brahms would have played them because Brahms 
is in a sense before that watershed moment. So how did Brahms actually play? What do we know about Brahms's performance style? One thing people say is that he was very restrained. He didn't like to play in a flashy or exuberant manner, but they talked of him coaxing the music or coaxing the emotion into the music. He thought very much about phrases, about the power of the phrase, which incidentally is rather different from Mendelssohn, because as we've said in the Mendelssohn episode, um, in Mendelssohn's time, phrasing as such was not something that was spoken of. Um, the references were still to articulation and slurring. But by the time of Brahms, we talk about building the music up in phrases. Um, Brahms did not like excessive rubato, which again is starting to sound a bit like Mendelssohn, isn't it? But people commented his elasticity, which is almost the same thing, but not quite. So we get a sense of the rather conservative, rather restrained, but nevertheless passionate Brahms that we associate with his music in general. This piece requires two manuals, and although no actual stops are mentioned, um, the whole piece is marked P, and if we take Mendelssohn's general um, guidance on registration into account there, that means one or two quiet eight foot stops. The two manuals want a slightly contrasting but um, similar level of registration. Personally, I tend to use something slightly stringier on the second manual than on the first manual, but that's purely a personal preference. There's a slight oddity in bar six where Brahms indicates a return to manual one, but then puts it in brackets and follows it up with a proper return to manual one just a few bars later. In all probability, he, well, I don't know if he changed his mind, um, but in any event, it works a lot better with the return to manual one a few bars later, and we just ignore the one in brackets. Just looking at how to weight those opening phrases, for example, it seems in this piece as though we need to be aiming for the ends of the phrases. So da 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 rather than ta da 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 and particularly where there is multiple repetitions da 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 Certainly, we don't want to be emphasizing each time. So, in general, um, as we've talked about Brahms's phrasing, uh, we're, we're looking at a phrase concept where we're looking towards the end of the phrases all the time in this piece. And it needs just to gently flow inevitably onwards. But all in all, it's a piece which I always say to the students, just to play as it is. We don't need to do anything to it to make it effective. Just feel it and play it. And I, well, I hope that you love it as much as I do and will go away and uh, try it out. Mm -hmm.